On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 220. The number of Palestinian casualties in Gaza, both militants and civilians, crosses 35,000. Al-Qassam brigades report losing contact with a unit guarding four Israeli hostages, including one shown in a video three weeks ago. Expansions of ground fighting in Gaza, IDF operating in Jabalia refugee camp and Zaytun in northern Gaza, while eyewitnesses state IDF tanks moving westward in Rafah. New York Times publishes report estimating Yahya Sinwar is not in Rafah and that he never left Han Yunis. Hezbollah introduces new missile in its attacks on northern Israel, reportedly packing a warhead of over 120 kilos. The United States reportedly working with regional Arab countries bypassing Israel in order to plan a political future for the Gaza Strip. Hello everyone, I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the latest highlights from the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the evening of May 13, 2024 in the United States, the morning of May 14, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, despite reports from Doha and Qatar that negotiations will resume in the coming days, there have been no updates about any scheduled negotiations in the last two days. This may be associated with the fact that in Israel it has been Memorial Day and Independence Day both yesterday and today, and thus the government is largely shut down and ministers and the Prime Minister are busy in other events. However, it is important to note that since the negotiation rounds collapsed in Egypt, there has been no high-level negotiations that have been going on. Again, Qatar says they are going to try to resume those negotiations in the coming days. In addition to this, on May 13th, the Al-Qassam Brigades, Hamas's military wing, released a statement with regards to four hostages that are held in the Gaza Strip. The statement declared, and I quote, Due to the brutal Israeli bombardment over the past 10 days, we have lost contact with a group of our fighters guarding four Israeli captives, including Hirsch Goldberg Polin. Polin is a U.S.-Israeli citizen who was last seen in the video that Hamas released on April 25th. It is possible that Hamas is referring to the ongoing b bombardments that are happening both in Rafah and in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. It is also possible that contact with him was lost because they may have been held in an apartment in the eastern parts of Rafah where the invasion is happening. It is also, of course, possible that this is not actually true. It is very likely that al Qassam is publishing this in order to try to beef up the pressure in Israel on the Israeli government in order to come to a, to a hostage deal rather than push on the invasion in Rafah. Either way, that is what has been reported in the last 48 hours. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, the trend of the last week of escalating fire of rockets and mortars from the Gaza Strip continued in the last two days, with substantial escalations on May 12th and a few more launches on May 13th. Several barrages of rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip towards the Israeli city of Ashkelon. Rockets also targeted the areas of Kisufim, Sderot, Ivim, Gevim, Nir Am, and other areas. There were two more barrages that was fired towards Sderot on May 13th, and rockets were also fired towards the areas of Kerem Shalom, with two interceptions noted by the IDF. In addition to this, rockets were also fired towards the areas of Nativa Asara and Miflasim. Again, all this happened in the last two days as part of the rising trend of rocket fire in the last week. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, on May 12th, the IDF launched its operation in Jabalia refugee camp, this is in the eastern parts of Gaza City, with 30 airstrikes being carried out prior to the ground invasion. Very intensive gun battles were reported on May 13th. The Al Qassam brigades also claimed responsibility for firing Yassin 105 missiles towards IDF tank, publishing a video seen here on May 13th showing the IDF tank being targeted and hit. Intensive gun battles were reported throughout Jabali refugee camp, as well as major bombing raids being reported targeting underground infrastructure in the area. This is the second time that the IDF is carrying on an operation in that area. I remind everyone that the IDF said it achieved operational control of the northern parts of the Gaza Strip already in December of 2023. Since then, it is carrying out these more localized raids. Similar to this is ongoing intensive fighting going on in Zaytun, this is also in the southern areas of Gaza City. The IDF is reportedly carrying out as an extensive operation there in Zaytun. This is the third operation the IDF is carrying out. Each time the IDF pulls out, Hamas starts to regain control, and the IDF is carrying out more operations. In addition to this, on May 12th, the IDF and the Israeli Shabak put out a joint statement stating that Naim Gul, who is an operative of Hamas's Shati Battalion, who was in charge of holding Noam Marziano, an Israeli hostage who was killed in the Gaza Strip, was assassinated.
The Al-Aqsa News Channel also reported on this, stating that the attack took place near the Palestine Stadium in the heart of Gaza City. Nor Marziano was a hostage that was kidnapped on October 7th. Her body was recovered near the areas of Al-Shifa Hospital as the IDF invaded that area already in November. Reportedly, Naim Gul, one of the people who was holding her, has now been assassinated. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, on May 12th, the Shihab Palestinian news site reported that Talal Abu Zarifa, who is a member of the Politburo of the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, was assassinated in the central parts of the Strip. The Democratic Front of the Liberation of Palestine is one of the smaller Palestinian terror groups that are operating in the Gaza Strip. It is an offshoot of the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine, one of the larger communist groups operating. Both the Democratic Front and the Popular Front participated in October 7th. However, according to most estimates, they were not part of the planning of October 7th. Simply when it broke out, they sent their troops to participate. According to some reports, the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine were holding several hostages. It is possible the Democratic Front were also holding hostages. That was not part of the report. Either way, Talal Abu Zarifa, a member of the Politburo, was assassinated. In addition to this, in the central parts of the Strip, on May 13th, there were substantial airstrikes that were reported in the old Nusirat refugee camp targeting a building in the area. According to reports, 14 people were killed in that bombing. In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, there's continuing fighting in the southeastern parts of Rafah, with several tunnel entrances being destroyed and launching sites being attacked with airstrikes. The IDF reportedly raided the school in the area of the southeastern parts of Rafah, uncovering major weapons caches and other, and other weaponry within that compound. Substantial helicopter attacks were also reported in this area of the southeastern regions of Rafah, and there, and there are mortars that were also reported targeting IDF troops in the area. In addition to this, the Palestinian communication companies reported that the internet services in the southern parts of Gaza have crashed in the last two days. While reports are that this is likely due to infrastructure damage, this is noteworthy for several different reasons. First, in the past, there have been at least seven different communications and internet blackouts that occurred in the Gaza Strip right before the IDF carried out the major incursion. Importantly, also in the central parts of the Strip, of the, strip the internet services crashed right before the IDF carried out a high-profile assassination in that area several months ago. So it is possible this may be associated with that. In addition, this is also noteworthy because it is also possible that when the Al-Qassam brigades are saying that they lost communications with a unit that was guarding the different hostages in the area, it is possible that they lost that communication because of the downfall of the internet in the area. Again, all that is speculation at this point. All I'm, all I'm reporting is that the internet services have crashed and that it may be noteworthy in, a, in relation to several different other facets that are developing. In addition to the ongoing fighting, on May 13th, Palestinian sources on the ground in the southern parts of the Strip reported that IDF tanks have crossed the Salah Hadin Road in Rafah, moving westward. This unto itself does not mean an odd invasion of the western side of the city. However, it does indicate a certain expansion of where the IDF is operating, possibly leading up to a larger, a larger expansion in the fighting. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. On May 12th, the New York Times published an extensive report on Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, stating that according to intelligence estimates, Sinwar is not located in Rafah, but rather is still in the Hayunis area. According to the report, both the United States and Israeli intelligence agencies estimate that Hanunas houses the largest network of tunnels in the Gaza Strip, and that some of these go as deep as 15 stories underground. The estimates are that Sinwar and his brother, Muhammad Sinwar, are both, are both located within these tunnels, and that they are surrounded by live hostages. I am adding that it is very likely that if they are surrounded by hostages, it is, it is probably the IDF soldiers who were kidnapped. This is due to the view of Hamas that the IDF soldiers are themselves fighters and that is more prestigious as opposed to the civilians that are captured. That is an estimate according to the report he is surrounded by live hostages. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. Amidst the ongoing dialogue between the United States and Israel about an all-out Rafah invasion, on May 12th it was reported that the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke to the head of Israel's National Security Council, Tzachy Anegbi. According to reports, Sullivan expressed the United States' continued concern about a large-scale Rafah invasion, and the two agreed to have the teams that were discussing the Rafah operation meet face-to-face -face in the coming days. The following day, on May 13th, Sullivan stated in a press conference that the United States wants to see Hamas destroyed, but that a large-scale IDF invasion of Rafah will be a mistake. The wording of that is very important, because with this, the United States is reverting to language that was previously used, uh, in the last several weeks, the United States has stopped saying that Rafah will be a mistake and instead has said in several different times that they are okay with a Rafah invasion if it's a small scale, but that they, are, they disagree with the methods or different things like that. Now this seems to be reverting to stating the operation will simply be a mistake.
In addition to this, earlier statements were made on May 13th in the White House, again stating that the United States has yet to see an Israeli plan for the safe evacuation of civilians from Rafah, and expressing the United States is not going to support an all invasion of Rafah without seeing such a plan. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last two days, leaving the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 272. 22 IDF soldiers reported injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 48 hours, bringing the total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began to 1,674. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that 120 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last two days, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to over 35,000. It is now 35,091. A total of 78,827 Palestinians were reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. I remind everyone that those numbers include both civilians and militants. According to the last numbers that were published by the IDF over a month ago, the IDF estimates that between 12,000 and 13,000 militants have been killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began. With regards to these numbers of casualties, the United Nations Office of Humanitarian Affairs, OHCA, updated its numbers of casualties in Gaza in the last several days, cutting the percentage of Palestinian casualties that they are reporting are women and children under the age of 19 to more than half of what has been reported previously. Between May 6 and May 8, the number of casualties that were reported to be women went down from 9,500 to 4,959, and the number of children went down from 14,500 to 7,797, again out of the total number of casualties that are being reported. While this was done without a public statement by the UN, the numbers just changed between the reports, different UN officials were asked about this throughout the day, and different agencies that explored this uncovered that the previous numbers that the UN were citing were, were coming from the Gaza Communications Ministry in the Gaza Strip, which I have stated in many of my different reports is an, a very unreliable source of information. The new figures are being reported by the Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip, which, while it's still part of the Hamas government, is considered to be far more accurate as it accounts for bodies that end up in hospitals, rather than being more of a propaganda arm like the Communications Ministry in the Gaza Strip. It's also important to note that the total number of those killed is not affected. The United Nations is still reporting the same amount of numbers of those killed, and thus it does not change the numbers in my reports as well. However, I have been asked about this change in the United Nations several times throughout the day as it has made a lot of news, and thus I'm just trying to clarify what the UN is changing is the percentage of women and children that have been killed in the Gaza Strip, f reporting, f changing its report from the Palestinian Communications Ministry, which... I would argue is more of a propaganda machine to the Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip, which is considered more reliable. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, Egypt continues to refuse to coordinate the reopening of the Rafah crossing with the IDF. The IDF took over the Rafah crossing already a week ago, since then the crossing has been closed. This has led to a substantial decrease in the entrance of aid trucks into the Gaza Strip. According to reports, Israel is attempting to increase the entrance of aid trucks through different routes. However, Rafah was a main route of aid trucks entering. Egypt is stating that the way Israel has taken over the, the crossing and trying to open it, it is not acceptable to Egypt based on past treaties between the countries. Thus, that crossing remains closed. Amidst this, on May 12th, the IDF announced the opening of Erez South, which is an additional northern crossing that has been constructed to allow aid to enter directly into the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Despite not being completed, the crossing was opened and 40 trucks entered already on May 12th. Likely this is associated with that previous report that the Israel was trying to expand the entrance of aid trucks from different directions. Other news, on May 13th, members of the Tzav 9 movement, this is a movement that is protesting the entrance of aid into the Gaza Strip within Israel, escalated their activities against the entrance of humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. Stopping trucks at the Tarkumia checkpoint, which is a checkpoint in the West Bank near Hebron, protesters were seen vandalizing trucks and damaging nine of them, with cargo being thrown off and one of the trucks being torched. These are some of the images, uh, images from the scene, between three to four people were arrested as part of this riot. Officials in the United States reportedly spoke to their Israeli counterparts condemning these acts and calling on Israel to ensure that such things do not repeat themselves. This was also condemned by several different countries in Europe. In addition to this, Al Jazeera reported on May 13th that two employees of the World Health Organization, a Palestinian driver and a foreign national, were killed in an airstrike in Rafah. The IDF confirmed that a vehicle was fired upon near the Rafah crossing, saying the investigation is still exploring if the IDF soldiers carried out that fire or if it was fire that was carried out by Hamas.
Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there is continuous escalations of the last several weeks, also in the last 48 hours. However, as I will state, there are many more drone attacks as opposed to rocket and missile attacks. On May 12th, Hezbollah announced that it fired a new missile in its barrage that was fired towards the areas of Hardov. The missile, named Jihad Mornia, after the son of Iman Mornia, one of the top commanders of Hezbollah that was previously assassinated, was reportedly used for the first time. On May 13th, more information was published about this missile. It was described as an unguided tactical missile, packing a huge 120 kilo warhead. Reportedly, it is the third missile that Hezbollah is now introducing during these escalations. In addition to this, on May 12th, there were rocket attacks that were fired towards Kibbutz Iftach and Kiryat Shmona in the northern parts of Israel, and anti-tank missiles were also fired towards areas of Mergeliot. On May 13th, there were anti-tank fire that was reported towards areas of Kibbutz Iftach, injuring four IDF soldiers. Anti-tank missiles were also fired towards areas of Malachia, and rockets targeted the area of Mevot Achermon. In addition to this, throughout the past days, there have been extensive drone attacks that were reported fired by Hezbollah towards Israel, including targeting the areas of Gaaton, Yahiam, Ein Yaakov, and Kabri. On May 13th, drone alerts were also sounded throughout the Upper Galilee, including in the areas of al Tush, Ntua, and Abirim. There were earlier drone alerts also in the areas of Dafna, Shar Yeshuv, Snir, and Kibbutz Dan. In addition to this, there were several suicide drones that were launched into the area. Two of these reportedly crashed in the areas of Beit Hillel, and others crashed in the Upper Galilee. In addition to all this, Hezbollah also claimed they carried out at least 10 border incidents in the last several days, including extensive fire at the Biranit outpost in the northern parts of Israel. Regarding IDF activity, on May 12th, the IDF carried out several strikes against Hezbollah launching sites in the areas of Halta and Tamam. In addition, Hezbollah infrastructure was also targeted in the areas of El Herbata. In addition to this, on May 13th, the IDF warplanes targeted launching sites in the areas of Ita Sha'ab, with substantial secondary explosions indicating a lot of weaponry in the area. Al Manar also reported attacks in the areas of El Adaisa, and there were several different artillery fires that were, lo- that were reported as well. It is noteworthy that the IDF has carried out a lot of less activity in southern Lebanon in the last several days. I mention this because this may be associated with reports that, that have come out in the last days, saying that the war cabinet in Israel is starting to consider the different armaments within Israel in, in light of the threats made in the United States, that it, the United States may limit its offensive weaponry that it transfers to Israel. Again, all that is speculation at this point. I am simply noting that there are less operations that are being carried out, or at least reported, by the IDF in Lebanon. Other news related to the ongoing escalations between Hezbollah and the IDF. On May 12th, the Lebanese Adiar newspaper published a report stating that Hezbollah has recently undertaken a new strategy resulting from the periodic review that was done in the war room of the different Iranian militias. Among others, the movement has pulled back a lot of its forces from the border in order to avoid more casualties and is relying more on drone attacks and mid-range missiles. In other news, on May 13th, Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah gave a speech stating, among others, After eight months of fighting, Israel is unable to rescue its hostages, cannot return its citizens to the areas around Gaza or the north, and cannot secure its ships, in that he's alluding to the Houthi attacks against Israeli maritime activity. He added, in order to remove the defeated image, Netanyahu wants to invade Rafah, and Nasrallah also then sent a message to Israeli citizens that have been evacuated in northern parts of Israel, stating, We are a friend that supports Gaza. We say to the settlers in the north, Go to your government and tell them to stop the war in Gaza. With that, Nasrallah is again implying that no matter what happens within, within Gaza, Hezbollah sees itself as supporting Hamas. If Hamas agrees to a ceasefire, then Hezbollah may accept it, However, if there is a separate deal that is done between, for example, Israel and Lebanon, this has nothing to do with Hezbollah's activity. Hezbollah is going to continue the fight as long as the fighting is continuing in Gaza. Some regional reports in the last several days. El Masira, which is a Houthi-affiliated news site in Yemen, reported that the coalition carried out a U.S.-U.K. joint attack targeting the Hudaydah airport in Yemen. No reports were given with regards to to what was specifically targeted in that attack. In addition, the U.S. Central Command reported destroying a Houthi drone that was on the ground, as well as a drone and nautical missiles that were in the air. The IDF also reported intercepting a drone that was penetrating Israeli airspace from the east. Usually this means that the drone was fired from areas like Iraq. However, at this point, all that was reported is that the drone penetrated Israeli airspace from the east.
Some political news from the last several days. On May 12th, Egypt announced that it is joining South Africa's lawsuit against Israel in the International Court of Justice in light of Israel's operation in Rafah. While in Israel was reported that Egypt joining the lawsuit is not expected to influence the court greatly, the court is right now debating emergency injunctions that South Africa has requested in light of the Rafah invasion, this move does signal an all-out low point in the relationship between Israel and Egypt since the peace treaty was signed between them in 1979. This is the first time that Egypt is appealing to an international court ac- acting against Israel. In addition, in what appears to be a small semantic difference in political rhetoric, but may actually bear some weight, Kurt Campbell, who's a deputy of the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, stated on May 13th in response to some questions in an interview, and I quote, When we listen closely to Israeli leaders, they talk about mostly the idea of some sort of sweeping victory on the battlefield, the concept of total victory. He added, I don't think that we believe that this is likely or possible. In addition, he added that in some respects the disagreements between Israel and the United States are over what would constitute such a total victory. While this may seem like semantics, I would argue this may be a a critical statement that is being made. This is the first time that an official in the United States is not stating a version of the United States and Israel share the same goal but may disagree on the method, but in fact is stating that the United States and Israel may disagree on the goal. The goal of both countries still remains the destruction of Hamas, but what will constitute that total victory that Israel is constantly saying, this is the first time that a senior U.S. official is saying, our understanding of what, may be, what is total victory may be different than that of Israel. Possibly relating to this, I'm moving on to one report regarding the future of the Gaza Strip. Speaking to CBS, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken raised on May 12th serious critique of Israel's lack of day-after plan for what is going to happen in the Gaza Strip after the war is over. He stated that in the areas that Israel has cleared Hamas out of, including northern Gaza and Han Yunis, Hamas has returned after the idea of withdrawal, since there's no effective plan put into play, i.e. there's a complete power vacuum and the only power structures that exist are those of Hamas. Relating to Rafah, Blinken stated that the IDF, quote, may go in and achieve some initial successes, possibly at a high cost of civilian lives. But Israel will deal with an ongoing uprising since many of Hamas's operatives will remain no matter what Israel does in Rafah. He added that once the IDF pulls out of Rafah, again I'm quoting, there will be a vacuum that will be filled by chaos and anarchy, and eventually by Hamas. After this, he added, importantly, and I quote, We are working for many weeks on a plan for security, governance, and rebuilding. We haven't seen it come from Israel. We have worked on it with Arab countries and other states. We have the same goal as Israel. We want to ensure that Hamas does not control Gaza again and make sure the street the strip is demilitarized. End quote. With that, Anthony Blinken is fully recognizing the United States is to some extent giving up on Israel trying to come up with a day after plan, what is going to be the future of the Gaza Strip, and instead has turned to work with regional Arab actors, possibly to present to Israel a fait accompli. This is what has been worked out with actors such as Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, again, I'm making those countries up, I know that is my assumption that what, of what Blinken means when he's talking about regional Arab actors. However, the fact that he is saying we haven't seen this come from Israel, therefore we're working with regional Arab actors is crucial, and is again a signal the United States is not willing to wait for what Israel is going to decide happens in the Gaza Strip. It sees the need to come up with a plan right now, specifically in light of the possible invasion of Rafah. If you find these reports informative, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Those are my highlights from the last several days. Thanks for watching.